All right, we'll get started with guys who touch this morning. the idea of um, ash potential, I want to introduce the, the people who did the, the research. The main guys were uh, Hutchkin and Hogsley. This was done in the 50s, 1952. And whenever you study something in biology, you have to get a good animal model. And, uh, they used the squid giant axon. Why did they use it? Well, why do they call it the squid giant axon? It's big. And for axon, which part of the cell is that? The area of input or output? Output. So that's what they're studying. They're studying the area of output of the cell, <clears throat> and they're seeing how the nerve impulse travels down it. And so they, they chose the biggest axon they could find in biology to study. I guess it's not too hard to find um, the giant squid. And so Loligo is scientific name for the squid. All right. And so um, I just want to cut and paste and show you the what's called the cable equations, why they use that term. Because remember, the axon is a large, long process like a cable. And we're not going to use this math, but I want you to appreciate that whenever you study uh, get a biological waveform in your, in your lab, you have to be able to use the math to describe it. And if your math can't explain what you observe in the lab, it's back to the drawing board. Now, we're not going to do this. I'm just going to explain the concepts. But this is straight from their paper. And you should understand it and be able to answer, uh, respond to this. HH, which is these guys, Huxley, Hodgkin, they propose that ash potential in the squid axon is caused by an inward membrane current followed by an outward current, and that those currents flow, flow through voltage-gated channels. Inward current. In lecture, what do we say the inward current is usually carried by? Which ion? Sodium. That's the inward current. We call that depolarization. What about the outward current? Carried by? Potassium. That those currents are carried by voltage gated channels. We've talked about those before too. So, with the squid giant axon, one thing you learn is they have voltage gated channels. We're not talking about the graded potentials. We're not talking about the resting membrane potential. Resting membrane potential is for the lead channels, and then the ligand-gated channels, um, those are for the graded potential. So now we're talking about the voltage-gated channels for the ash potential. So I'm going to show you a picture from your book. This show you, shows you um, the difference between what a graded potential and what an ash potential looks like. We talked about graded potentials the last time. So I included a picture of that on the top right. Well, let's compare the two, just what they look like here.
Ash potential versus let's list the first thing. The graded potential, you're trying to turn the cell on. Okay? And so you, you synapse onto Uh, three part well it's yeah three parts of the cell the dendrite the soma and the axon hillock that should be review we already talked about that dendrites soma the axon hillock because you're trying to turn the cell on for the ash potential the cell has been turned on and the nerve impulse is propagating down the area of output the axon. These are the areas of input. So the input versus uh, this is the output. <clears throat> okay, so the graded potential, when you try to turn the cell on, you we'll just look at one little graded potential. They're like they're like teeny weeny, they're very small. But they're graded, they can be smaller, smaller, or, or a little bit bigger. They're graded. They can be small, they can be larger. So there's like var varying degrees. Like it depends how much you're zapping the cell at the dendrites, so on acts on hill. They, they kind of like sum it, they add up. So they can be smaller, larger, or largest. The goal is to reach threshold. And we even put a number to it. It could be like negative 50 millivolts, negative 55, negative 60. Usually books will say something like that. Okay, you're trying to give it enough of a jolt. For rest. And what was rest? Minus, minus 70. That, that number may vary, but we're, we're mostly sticking to minus 70. So that's rest. Okay, the thing about ash potential is they're not graded. If you get an ash potential, it's like all or none. They're not graded. As you can see from the picture, there are big spikes. And you, you either get the whole big spike or none. So when they say it's all or none, it's not graded. <clears throat> graded potentials, if, if you don't achieve threshold, they, they die really fast. So they say that they're decremental. don't reach threshold, they decrement, they fizzle out, they poop out really fast, they die fast. If you do get an ash potential, they're non-decremental. They will propagate along the axon and they will never lose their magnitude. Non-decremental. They don't lose uh, magnitude. As the AP, which is my shorthand for ash potential, as AP um, propagates, as the AP propagates down the axon. Toward the axon terminal. That's the goal. Get all the way to the axon terminal because, as you know, once you get there, that'll trigger the release of the neurotransmitters. That's the whole point of turning the cell on. If you get those neurotransmitters released, communicate with the next cell. Toward the axon terminal.
So they're quite different, the graded versus the action. Um, the last thing I'll put, the channel type, I, I mentioned it. Graded potentials, um, when you're doing your area of input, basically the acetylcholine is binding the ligand-gated receptors. Ligand gated receptors. As an example, A C H R. <clears throat> and that opens the channel to get you your little graded potentials, whether it be large or small. And if you actually reach threshold and you turn the cell on, go over here, what you're doing is those graded potentials were enough to open the first action potentials on the axon. And you turn on the voltage gated channels. So let's remember the shape of our cell. little spiny dendrites. I didn't draw it very good, but soma dendrites axon hillock. And um, what you're trying to do is get enough of the influx of graded potential. Let's say you get a little influx there. But that's not enough. So you have to zap it a little more. Let's zap it in another place. Let's zap it in another place. Let's zap it in another place. And just try to get enough of a jolt. Maybe this is a very large cell. It's harder to turn on hard cells. So you need to like keep zapping until you reach the cell threshold. What you're trying to do is all this positive charge, like coming in at, on the dendrites, the soma, the axon hillock right there, you're trying to make this all converge in one direction. You're trying to turn on the voltage gated channels that exist in this first segment. Think of this as segments. You're not going to turn on the ones at the end. You want to try to turn on the voltage gated channels right here in this first segment. If you can affect the voltage gated channels of the first segment of the axon, then you'll get an action potential and it'll propagate all the way down this way. Now that's really the goal here. Just get it to turn on here, these voltage-gated channels, and then it'll propagate. But you need enough of a jolt in your areas of input to get this. All right, so here's all the parts of the cell. Just turn it on enough here, and then it'll, it'll travel down. And this is what you see, this big spike. So if you measure at any segment, as the nerve impulse passes your electrodes at any given segment, it looks like this. So you can measure here, 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 here. It always looks the same. Okay, so this is just a glimpse of what the nerve impulse looks like as it flies past your electrodes. And so um, in this figure, we have the millivolt wave trace, the purple line. But I like to use this figure um, that also includes the permeability curves for sodium and potassium. Because what I want you to understand is these permeability curves are causing the purple curve. Okay. When the cell is permeable to uh, sodium, when the cell is permeable to potassium, it's slightly, they're not identical waves. They're slightly different. And they're causing this big spike up and this big spike down. And you need to understand what's going on. Any questions on the difference between graded and action before I erase this? Yes. It's, well, that's one of the places. What are the other two? Dendrites and soma. 
I mean, um, it could just start there if it's big enough. But sometimes all three can just come into play. Okay, let's look at the voltage gated channels. Again, not the leak channels, not the ligand gated channels, the voltage gated channels. These have been studied extensively, and they're a little bit different. Key players, voltage gated channels. Two types sodium ones, the ones that allow the cell to be permeable to sodium. So I'll write sodium voltage gated channels. <coughs> they open with a change in voltage. sodium, well what does sodium do? Does it go in or out? It goes into the cell, the axon. Sodium influx. You know, we're talking about the axon here. Okay, look at the picture there. Sodium has two gates. Okay. So it looks like uh, one gate, a little four going through, but when the gates close, it looks like that gate closes it right there. This is called, these two things are called the activation gate. That's one gate. And the way they draw it in the picture on the left, it's closed. There's another gate that's open, it's hanging down here, that ball and chain. That's called the inactivation gate. They did a little globular ball and chain there. So they, they, they call this the rest condition the rest condition of the voltage-gated sodium channel. The rest state or something, rest something. <laughs> you haven't simulated the cell, it's closed. So what we say, if it's closed, is, well, okay, um, sodium's not getting in, so permeability to sodium is lower zero. Permeability means it can get in or out. Okay, if the permeability is low, sodium cannot get in because the channel is closed. Because the gate is closed, the activation gate is closed. The other gate is open, but that doesn't matter. As long as one of the gates are closed, sodium can't get in. Okay, so I'll just draw sodium not able to get in. The permeability of sodium is low. 
Now, if you were to stimulate um, the cell that's in the cell membrane, we draw a lipid bilayer here. What we've been saying is. Um, <coughs> The inside of the cell is mostly negative. But if um, you're zapping the cell with greater potentials, and this is the first one to be stimulated, if positive, uh, positive charges come along, they're, gonna, they're attracted to these negative charges. So I'm going to change all these from negatives to positives. And the same thing on this side. There's positive charges coming your way and they change all the negatives to positives. Um, this part of the gate has a positive charge. I mentioned this before. And that positives and positives, they repel. So like right here. Positive light charges repel there and there. So that will swing the gate open. Okay, that's the change in voltage when you get this current flow on the inside of the membrane there. And that's why they're voltage gated. This change in voltage opened the gate. So that middle picture shows the gate. Both gates are open in the middle picture there. <clears throat> so what I'll put on the board is if both gates are open, then you get your sodium influx. Okay, sodium current is the most powerful current measured in biology. I mean, they, we always show you just one picture of one channel, but they're just like in the cell memory, they're all over the place. They have a very high concentration. Sodium influx is powerful. And as we'll see, it creates a positive feedback. to get more sodium influx. It creates a positive feedback. Increasing more sodium influx as we'll see. So just to be super basic about this, if you um, want to simplify the acid potential to a big spike, when you look at a spike, there's two parts. There's the part that goes up, and there's the part that goes down, because this is against time. And it's always going to be millivolts. When you get the sodium influx, which is the part that, uh, for sodium influx, do you think it's the part that goes up or down? You got a 50-50 shot. What do you think it is? It's the part that goes up, and I think we've been saying that. We call that the depolarization. So what we, what we really say is, when the gate is open, the permeability is high, okay? And I just want you to compare two things. Compare the permeability of sodium to potassium. So all we say for this part that goes up is that the permeability P is for permeability. The permeability to sodium in the cell is much greater than the permeability to potassium. I want you to think of it like that. Is the cell permeable to one or the other? Okay. What's going to happen is to allow the spike to return to rest is the picture on the on this picture. Um, they call that inactivation. Sodium channel and activation. Okay, look at the picture. Which gate is closed? 
the inactivation gate. The um, activation gate's open. That doesn't matter. The activation gate is closed. One gate's open and one gate's closed. As long as one gate is closed, the permeability to sodium is low. Okay. So this is what matters right there. So what I'll have, what, we'll, what we'll learn is to repolarize, um, what happens is the cell, let me just sure reverse the arrow here. The permeability to sodium is less than the permeability of the potassium. And that'll allow potassium efflux to allow the cell to repolarize. The last thing I'll write about the voltage-gated sodium channels is the kinetics are fast. I mentioned this before too, I think. What that means is they open and close super fast. When I say kinetics, just how do they operate? The gates open and close super fast, as opposed to the, uh, the voltage-gated potassium channels. I see one gate, not two, and their kinetics are slow. So the voltage-gated potassium channels, one gate, it's either open or closed, slow kinetics. But when they do open, they allow potassium efflux. That one gate, when open, allows potassium efflux. And that will help the cell uh, repolarize its memory potential. And to make sure I didn't leave out any steps, I, I always like to go through um, each phase of the action potential. So when, when, I, when I put together these slides, I, I put the um, I put this picture here because you got to understand that. I put this picture here because you have to visualize what's going on with the voltage gated channels. And this picture here, it tells you which part of the action potential we're talking about. And we call this rest before you've <coughs> stimulated the cell. Negative 70 millivolts versus time. I'm talking milliseconds here. And um, in the first situation where you haven't stimulated the cell yet and you're just at rest, it's called this action potential phases. Rest doesn't mean equilibrium. I tried to emphasize that before. Again, for the umpteenth time, what's the millivolt you measure at rest? Negative 70 millivolts. So what's achieving that? Well, nothing except the leak channels. The leak channels are leaking, and the pump is maintaining those ionic gradients so that the inside of the cell is negative with respect to the outside. That's all that's happening. Leak channels are leaking. We, I talked about this already. That, that's the previous lecture. Leak channels with 
the sodium potassium ATPase pump, you know, operate. And if you look at the axon, we assume this is the axon, right? Um, everything is closed. So these gates are closed. Um, the, these gates are closed. So the voltage gated channels are all closed. And we're able to maintain rest. Okay. So basically nothing happening. So here we're at rest. So to turn the cell on, um, you must reach threshold. Let's say threshold is negative 55. I'll put it right around there. <coughs> Wait, whoops. I skipped a the slide. There's the pole. Okay, before you get to this slide, um, you first must reach threshold. So let's assume you, you stimulate the cell and you get enough of a graded potential, enough of a jolt. Allow enough sodium influx from the ligand gated channels. Allow enough sodium influx from the ligand gated channels. Not shown here. These are voltage gated channels. Let's use um, orange. You're going to reach. You got to reach threshold. So I'll draw like this. You just try to try to reach it. You got to you gotta get up to this this 55, which, is, which represents threshold. Which represents enough of the sodium influx to, to flow and affect the first part of the axon right here. So these cells will respond. They both respond at the same time to the same thing. But which one's faster? These ones. So these open and close before these respond. But they both respond to the same thing at the same time. You know, like the beginning of a, of a race. The starter, the gun goes off and everyone starts at the same time. But not everyone finishes at the same time. And these kinetics are faster. They start and end faster. So look, um, now that we've reached threshold, we can talk about depolarization. about it this way. The permeability of the cell so to sodium is much greater than that of potassium. The voltage gated sodium channel is open because of the sodium influx that opened it. I'll just put V gated sodium channels open. That's what the picture shows. Both gates are open. And the sodium influx is causing the cell to depolarize. So let's use, uh, so when the, these voltage gated channels open, to allow sodium influx. So you have a positive ion coming into the cell, and it's going to make the inside of the cell <coughs> negative. With, Excuse me, it's going to bring, it's going to make the inside of the cell less negative, more positive. Let's put some other things here. Here's zero. How about we go up to plus three millivolts? So what'll happen is you get some sodium influx. The inside of the cell becomes less negative, more positive. So I'll start to draw the line going up. That sodium influx will actually open more V-gated channels. Pretend there's like hundreds, thousands of these in the cell membrane. You get a little bit in, that influx will open more of those gates. Oh, 
open to more V-gated channels. Well, if you open more V-gated channels, you get more sodium influx. So you're going to keep going up and up and up. And then if you open more, you, you get more influx. And this keeps going around. And this is a, a very aggressive positive feedback cycle. It's very fast, very powerful. Positive feedback. That, that's what's happening here. Not negative, positive. And so in fact, this positive feedback is so powerful, you overshoot equilibrium. Remember what equilibrium is, zero. It's as positive inside as outside. You should stop there. But the, the flood is so fast, it's just, you can't stop it. You overshoot equilibrium. You go up all the way up to something like plus three. Depolarization is called the overshoot. You overshoot equilibrium. You go up to about plus 30. Okay. And uh, all right, so that's that's basically it. Any questions on depolarization? Repolarization. Now, let's look at the picture. Repolarization is just a reversal of what you did. Two, when you depolarized, what came in? Sodium. What charge does sodium carry? One full positive charge is a cation. Okay. So to repolarize, just to reverse it, you just let a positive out, and that's potassium. <coughs> and we'll look what's going on here. You have sodium channel and activation. Sodium channel inactivation. So that ball and chain plugs it. Okay. And so look at the permeability curve. The sodium channels, look at the yellow curve. The yellow is sodium. It went up super fast, and that caused the depolarization. But then it went down super fast. Okay, and the permeability turned on and off super quick. So for this sodium channel and activation shows why the yellow curve returned to baseline so quickly. So the permeability to sodium is basically super low, but now the permeability to potassium is super high. So look where I'm pointing right here. Okay, this is really important. Look right here where I'm pointing. Uh, maybe we just go like this. Right there. When permeability is completely off for sodium, it's like the highest for potassium. Okay, that's what I'm trying to get you to see. So during repolarization, because of the sodium channel and activation, the permeability of, so of the cell to sodium is much less than the permeability to potassium. Because remember, the potassium channels are slow. They just open. They start opening at the same time as the sodium channels, but they don't finally get open until later. And the, the sodium channels have completely closed by then, so they're done. So what that does is it allows... How do I use... 
in this condition allows the membrane potential to repolarize. A positive charge, potassium, is leaving. It makes the cell more negative, less positive. So this starts to it drops, it drops, it drops, it drops, it drops, it drops, all the way back to rest. Now the thing about the um, potassium channels is they open fast. Oh, excuse me. The potassium channels they open slow and they close slow. I mean, you have to look at the waveform for potassium. It's more spiky, which means it's fast. Open and close fast. Um, but the potassium curve, it's like a gentle hill. It r rises slow and then slopes down slowly. So all this time where permeability is decreasing, they're still open, but because they take such a long time to close, they remain open a little too long. It causes a hyperpolarization. During hyperpolarization, the permeability of the cell of sodium is still less than that of potassium. And then what happens is, well, I'll just describe it as the V gated potassium channels. too long, allowing the membrane potential to undershoot rest. Allowing the membrane potential to quote unquote undershoot rest. You know, which is our negative 70. So you just go a little bit past that. Usually they say it's close to negative 90. I'll go, I'll just go as low as I can and then kind of like, it looks like that. If you undershoot rest, maybe to, to get close to or at negative 90. Because that's the equilibrium potential, so you're not going to get any further than that. Okay. But you can return to rest because the, the action of the pump um, will finally kick in and eventually these will close, okay? If you look at the permeability curve, when it finally gets back to zero, I mean, it, it, the, the pumping of the sodium potassium ATPase pump, it'll eventually re-regulate re you back to negative 70. So it's rest, you reach your threshold potential, depole, repole, and hyperpolarization. I think those are all the details. I want to watch some videos showing some of these experiments. Is there any questions on the basis of the action potential? Sorry, I can't make the screen bigger. But what we're going to watch, well, actually, you should pay attention because um, on your lab, I put some questions that you could answer by watching these videos. And if you don't get it now, I mean, it's online. You can watch it. 
maybe a one. I want you to actually see the squid giant axon. It's like a, it really is like a tube, like a tel telephone cable. So now you see him cleaning it. <coughs> It usually takes about half an hour to clean an axon and to leave it bare of all the small fibers, often over a distance of about five centimeters. When finished, the giant axon alone remains, a single animal cell, several centimeters in length, and in this case, about 650 microns in diameter. Each small division of the scale is 100 microns. A cell this size weighs about 20 milligrams, so that it is not surprising that the giant axon was first used as a source of cytoplasm. In 1937, Baer, Schmidt, and Young, working at Woods Hole, studied the protein constituents from samples which they obtained simply by squeezing the cytoplasm out of the cut end. Later workers made precise measurements of the electrolytes and found that the concentration of potassium was much higher and that of sodium much lower than in the surrounding body fluids. It was for studies of the viscosity of cytoplasm that a cannula was first inserted into the axle and it has since proved such a valuable tool that it is now used routinely. A thread is attached to each end of the axon and pinned down to hold it taut. In addition, two threads which will later secure the cannula are slackly tied round. The cannula itself is a carefully drawn piece of glass tubing, the end of which has been ground down to form a smooth oblique tip, slightly smaller than the diameter of the axon. The next step is to cut, without severing the axon, a notch in its wall large enough to accommodate the cannula. A micro-manipulator provides the fine adjustment needed to pass the cannula through the notch and some distance along the axon. Once in place, the loop of thread is brought up and the cannula secured. Finally, the threads are trimmed and the uncleaned end of the axon removed. An electrode was first placed inside the axon by Hodgkin and Huxley in 1939 at Plymouth and by Curtis and Cole in 1940 at Woods Hole. Hodgkin and Huxley first made a plastic cell and mounted it on a platform which could be raised and lowered like a lift. As Professor Baker shows, the axon held by the cannula was then hung in the cell, which was filled with seawater and connected to an external electrode. The internal electrode, which was not attached to the lift, was then placed vertically above the axon, with its tip in the cannula. It was centered with respect to the cannula and axon by placing a small mirror beside the axon arranged so that a second image at right angles to the first was seen through the microscope. By adjusting the position of the cell, both horizontally and vertically, the cannula and axon were now raised up over the tip of the electrode, which always remained in the same line of sight. Hodgkin and Huxley found that as the electrode entered the axon, a negative potential with respect to the external seawater of about 65 millivolts was obtained. This was the resting potential of the axon, and although its existence had long been suspected, this was the first time it had been directly measured. 
Moreover, when the axon was stimulated, the action potential did not simply fall to zero during the impulse, but became positive with respect to the outside, shown by the overshoot of the action potential. This important discovery suggested that the nerve membrane which at rest is mainly permeable to potassium becomes primarily permeable to another ion during excitation. This other ion is sodium, since if its concentration in the external solution was lower, the action potential immediately became smaller by an amount depending on the sodium concentration. If, as these experiments suggest, the action potential was dependent on the passage of ions across the membrane, it was obviously important to measure the currents carried by these ions. Okay, we'll stop it there. It gets a little dicey after that. But um, I think you can understand everything that they did there. You know what resting membrane potential is? What do they measure it as? Yeah. Negative 65 in the squidgeon axon. You can actually see the axon. It's not a round cell. It's a cylindrically shaped process of a cell. Okay, so just get back to where we were. So here's some of the um, concepts I make. Sh I want to make sure all the bases are covered. You know, all the properties of the action potential that we talked about earlier. First one: threshold must be reached. <coughs> properties of the AP. threshold, nothing happens. You know, the bigger jolt, uh, nothing happens, okay? But if you fully reach threshold, you get the full spike. So just think of it as an on or off switch. Off, off, on. Right, it's either off or on. It's, it's pretty binary now. Um, that's why we call it all, off number two, all of them firing. It's all or none. It's either off or on. I think it's a very simple concept to understand. The other thing is that it's non-decremental. Four. Oh, number three. Skip one. Refractory period it ensures one-way propagation. helps to um, think of the axon in segments, like I said earlier. You have this spiny cell, all the dendrites. So let's think of this in segments. I'll just draw little lines to indicate segments. Think of the axon in segments. You're trying to jolt the cells to turn on. So you, you give it a little jolt, all this positive comes in. Let's say it's enough that they all convert <coughs> to this first segment right here, and you trigger those to turn on. So you get your sodium influx, I'll put a plus sign, you get sodium influx. Okay, now it's like, consider this, the rest of the cell, it's all negative, because it's at your resting membrane potential, right? But the first one got turned on. 
Now you have a choice. You could go backwards into the cell or you could go down the axon. So I look backwards and I see it's all still positive. I just got turned on. So like charges repel, well, I'm going to go this way. So then that turns on the voltage gated channels in this segment so then you can get sodium influx. So I'll turn that on to a negative into a positive. I have another choice. Which way do I go? I look behind, it's still positive, it's still in refractory period. I don't want to go backwards. I'm going to go this way. It's, it's negative here. So you just keep going and you just propagate down each segment. So that's the refractory period. The previous segment is still positive-ish because it just got depolarized. So it travels one way, never backwards. Um, so we call refractory period a period of insensitivity. You, you can't get another AP. Basically, can get another actual potential. Because you just got one, it's like you can't stack them up. Okay? Can't re stimulate. However, however you want to, what makes it work in your brain can re stimulate. Different way of saying the same thing. Um, okay, let's look at the next slide here. There's relative and absolute refractory period. See the green shade? They call that absolute refractory period. Um, the dark blue shade is relative refractory period. So let's know the difference between those two. another AP. Let me change my batteries real quick. That's in here. But I want you to know what's going on with the voltage-gated sodium channels. You can't get another P AP at all, ever. Why? I mean, what's happening? You already have an AP going on. Okay, like for example, um, so basically what I say for the absolute, it's absolute factor, you can't get another AP because the sodium channels are inactivated. That ball and chain gate is plugged it up. And you can't get that to open again. V-gated sodium channels are inactivated. So boom, no way, no how. But then you get to the dark blue where it's like, eh, okay. It's, you usually don't get another ash potential, but you could if the stimulus is big enough. Relative. Possibly get another AP if the stimulus is strong enough. Look at where they, they shade the dark blue. This is mostly, this is during the hyperpolarization. Okay, 
And during that time, the sodium channels, they're no longer inactivated. They've returned to their <coughs> rest state. Remember what we called it earlier? Activation gate close, then activation gate open. We called that the rest state. So during hyperbolarization, sodium channels return to rest state. So that, it is possible to get another one, but you got you got to give it a big jolt because. Well, let me draw it again. Threshold, pow, and you hyperpolarize. And at that point, when you're still in a state of hyperpolarization, you can get another one, but you need more of a jolt to reach threshold, right? So it's like jolt here, pow, and you drop down further. And it's like, oh man, I gotta go all the way up to here. You see what I'm saying? It's like that distance to reach threshold. It's like it's like more. That's why you need a bigger jolt, because it's like you've hyperpolarized and you need a bigger jolt. That's all it is. Okay, so let me go back to the previous slide. Any questions on refractory period? Ah, non-decremental. Okay, well, let's make sure you know what that is. Actually, let's take a break now. We'll finish the list after break. Come back at 9, and we shall continue.